I'd now like to introduce Simon Sadler. Simon is originally from the north coast of New South Wales and has now lived in the Illawarra Shoal Haven area for the last 10 years. He's, he has more than 20 years experience working in the field of nutrition, health development, advocacy, clinical service delivery, policy development and public health. He's had an opportunity to build a career working with vulnerable communities to national governments throughout Australia, Asia, Africa and the Pacific. Since 2013, he has been the manager of the Aboriginal Health and Integrated Care team at Grand Pacific Health. A key part of that role is to work with the local Aboriginal health teams and communities to coordinate the delivery of health services across southern New South Wales and the ACT. He is passionate about working in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to close the gap in health, education and employment. Simon will be speaking on the impact of natural disasters on mental health and wellness, a very topical point at the moment for all of us. Welcome, Simon. Hi, everyone. My name's Simon Sadler. I'm the manager for the Aboriginal and Integrated Care Team at Grand Pacific Health. Um, I'd like to just start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we're meeting on today across all the different lands and pay my respects to elders past, present and those coming in the future. I'd particularly like to, to acknowledge the traditional custodians, uh, custodians who are joining us today and, and those who have been affected um, by the bushfires on the, across New South Wales um, over the past, you know, past six months really to, to March last year. Um, I'd also like to, to acknowledge and pay the deepest respects to um, my Aboriginal health team at Grand Pacific Health um, and for them um, sharing sharing their stories and, and really allowing me to, to share this with you today. Um, with that, I'd actually like to... Um, to just give a little bit of a warning um, for, for some people, we, we, I've got some images in the presentation I'll show you today of some of the fire scenes down south and I'll be discussing some issues that may cause some distress for people, so particularly for people though who have been affected directly by the recent fires. Um, what, I, what I'd say to you all is that there, there are services that can, uh, that can help. So I've put two down there, Lifeline and Beyond Blue, and their numbers are there. They provide 24-hour crisis support and suicide prevention counselling. Just for anybody, if this raises issues um, for you and, and what I talk about today, um, I'd, I'd really like to just say at the outset, I, I really do pay my respects to the resilience and the communities across New South Wales who have, who have been battling um, or still dealing with issues relating to bushfires since really September last year. Um, it's, we've certainly seen it influence our work and I'll talk a little bit about what we do at Grand Pacific Health. But, um, yeah, from the outset, I'd like to say thank you to RDN for, for giving us the opportunity to be able to tell this story. And um, I, I hope that, you know, many other organisations who, who work in the area know I've experienced the same thing. So I hope this is helpful and um, provides a little bit of insight. By way of background, I thought I'd just touch on some of the different streams and services that Grand Pacific Health provide. Um, they can be categorised into three broad areas, so mental health services, um, and those are primary uh, mental health services, so to do around suicide prevention, early childhood intervention mental health program, and integrated recovery services, and then also more psycho psychosocial supports. So looking at um, the Next Steps program, which provides support to families affected by suicide or people who have attempted suicide. The Housing and Accommodation Support Initiative, which operates out of the Shoalhaven. And the Community Living Support for Refugees program that, that really works across the state. GPH also runs a number of headspace services, so around youth mental health particularly, but also physical health. And then around primary health, and this is where the services that I'm, I'm privileged enough to work with 
around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. We've been working in this field for, for more than 10 years now. We, we put a lot of emphasis and a lot of, a lot of value into the relationships that we've forged with community over that time. Um, we've walked together for a long time now and, um, we, we're really respectful and grateful of that relationship. Uh, we work primarily in health screening, so making sure Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from across the region are getting health checks done through their local GP. Uh, we provide an integrated care and support program, which is really helping people with chronic disease manage their condition so they get to their specialist appointments, to their allied health appointments through home visits and those sorts of things. Uh, we do a number of chronic outreach services, so particularly around diabetes, where we provide um, endocrinologists, a range of allied health professionals from podiatrists, Aboriginal health workers, um, so that community people can see all those different professions on one day in one visit, essentially. And uh, also a number of preventative health services, so from uh, boot camp type serve programs to aquaerobics and a lot of cultural programs as well. Uh, we also run a number of preventative health programs, integrated health care for, for the wider population, with chronic disease management. And we also run a couple of primary care facilities in the Shoalhaven and Illawarra and also um, an eating disorder service as well. So a little bit about our footprint. Um, you can see we cover a broad range of southern, southeastern New South Wales out to the ACT, so stretching from the Illawarra in the north down to Eden, down to the Victorian border. So we cross 14 different local government areas. Uh, according to the census in 2016, we had nearly 600,000 people in our catchment region. Um, of those, uh, we we'd nearly have 21,000 people who identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. So, we've, as I said, we're very proud to, to have working relationships there. Um, in terms of our statistics, we're an organisation of around 250 employees. Uh, we have 14 offices across the region. So particularly the regions I'll be talking about today, the Shoalhaven, the Yurubadala around Maruya and, and the Bega Valley. And um, very proud of our Aboriginal health team. We, we work, have a uh, number of our staff are, are well-known families from very respected families who have worked in community and lived in community for countless generations. So um, they have a, an intimate knowledge and, and this is some of what we'll talk, we'll talk about today an inter intimate knowledge of the region and, and the health issues that are affecting affecting those communities. So essentially, um, as I've said, we, we've worked for, for a long period of time with the with many of the communities across the region, but particularly in the Yurubadala, Bega and Shoalhaven. And um, a lot of the issues affecting communities in this region are similar to, to other parts of New South Wales where transport or regional parts of New South Wales where people struggle to get access to, to all sorts of services, whether they be mental health services, specialist services or allied health services. Um, there, there is, um, for many, transport's a, a big limitation. Um, a lot of lifestyle-related disease, so many of our clients experience things like uh, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, renal disease, cancer, all of those, those programs that unfortunately and disproportionately affect our Aboriginal brothers and sisters um, across the region. And um, we've also felt that for, for many months now, really, community has struggled in these regions, particularly with a number of local issues around around sorry business, around the passing of, of many of the important elders and, and very influential young people in community. And that's have a that's really had a devastating impact before we even start talking about bushfires and the impact, the mental health impact of of those types of disasters. So I, I guess what I'm trying to do is paint a little bit of a, a portrait into what's happening in, in some of these communities before we even start talking about bushfires. So 
Um, across New South Wales, really from September last year into March this year, we, we obviously experienced one of the first worst fire seasons that the country has experienced in, in, our, in our known kind of written, oral, uh, written history. Really started up around the mid north coast, um, and um, sadly in December, um, a number of communities in the south coast region where we are um, affected were affected by bushfires. Um, many of our staff, uh, obviously, were were talking about you know um, being on high alert, and and not for really only for a matter of days or weeks, but really months because these fires stretched. Um, from from December last year, and, and I remember still having conversations with staff about who were concerned about being evacuated in late February. So this is um, many months of, of kind of impact on these people. So across this, the state, we had around 2,450 houses, homes lost. Um, another thousand, more than a thousand homes were damaged during the um, during the fires. Incredible though, uh, 14, 14 and a half thousand homes were saved across the state. So that just acknowledges the, the effort that the, the different fire services have had on, on, um, saving people's homes essentially. Sadly, we had 25 fatalities across the state, um, and a, a massive 5.4 million hectares burned across the state over that period, um, not to mention the countless impact on, on wildlife, you know, property damage, a, a whole range of damage to roads, signs, all of those sort of things. Um, and about about a third to, to almost a half of that damage or 40% of the damage occurred in the Shoalhaven, Yorubadala and Bega Valley regions. So the impact was particularly hard felt in those regions. And as I mentioned, the impact was also prolonged. It was over a period of nearly three months. Um, many of our staff essentially report um, being in trauma, you know, always being on alert, you know, never getting a good night's sleep essentially because they were worried that there'd be uh, an alert coming over the radio or or their phones would start ringing when they had had mobile coverage and just being in a constant state of vigilance. Um, and that had, took a real impact um, over that period. Obviously, it was Christmas and New Year. Traditionally, that's a time where families come together, and a lot of our staff and a lot of our clients really felt that that they'd just been on the go, um, um, for, for, on high alert for many, many months. Um, so, yeah, you can see really the the devastating impact that that had. Um, now, what I'm going to do is just show a few in images, and I'd just like to acknowledge the photographer of some of these, Adam Meredith. He's a he's a photographer from the Batemans Bay area, and and really the image he captures, I think, fairly um, they're quite um, in in many ways beautiful. It wasn't if it wasn't so devastating, the photos are actually quite spectacular. But I just wanted to acknowledge Adam and, and his his efforts and thank him for letting us use these photos in this presentation. So as I mentioned, um, the communities that we're working with were really already affected by trauma and and subsequent to the fires post March with the the spread of COVID. And even now with the, the Black Lives Matter movement coming out of the US and, and gathering momentum globally, that's really had a big impact on many of our Aboriginal families who, who are just, in a, you know, gone from one trauma to another. Again, in March, we had a number of passings from um, local elders a lot of mental illness, suicide attempts, um, and, and really just to under, uh, to, to, it's impossible to under emphasize the impact that, that these different natural disasters and COVID and other things have had, had on, on mental, mental health. So talking about, um, some of the um, some of the impacts of these in community, we, we found our response was really in two phases. So there, as many organisations so uh, that work in the area of health um, didn't get much of a holiday over the Christmas period, there was an immediate emergency 
effect to um, really mobilise staff and resources to get them out and, and to provide whatever support was needed. And for many of us, and well, all of us really, this is uncharted territory. Um, most of us haven't lived through a, a bushfire, particularly one of this magnitude. And we really wanted to get and, you know, provide that immediate type support um, to, to local um, communities. Um, in the very um, immediate response, what that involved, and there are a number of our affected, uh, affected families who, who lost houses, lost possessions. Um, many of our staff were at different times um, evacuated from their homes. Um, and, you know, there was times where people couldn't access the emergency um, refuges and so they had to essentially use the GPH offices just to provide some sort of respite and, and shelter, um, which we were, were very um, fortunate to be able to, to support that. Um, Obviously, that impact is not only affecting um, those communities, but the, our staff are from those communities as well. So, again, just to pay my respects, that often our staff were, were turning up for work to provide support and services to others when, when their own families were, were going through a significant trauma and crisis. So, as you can see, these are, are some of the images from around the Batemans Bay area, um, just showing um, really the fires off into the distance and and the sense of impending doom. I think that people experience really um, talks to the to the level of trauma that that's still in community and will take a long time to get over. Really. Um, Essentially, uh, I mentioned before that um, our services were divided into two parts. Um, there was the immediate impact um, or the immediate response that we were trying to, to uh, implement with our, with our um, service, um, with our community and service uh, access holders. Um, and, and really that involved doing some vulnerability checks. And that was more than just a psychological, are you okay, out, are you out of danger? We were looking at providing supports in terms of making sure people had access to their essential medicines. So particularly in terms of diabetes care, we're obviously getting insulin and things like that are, are particularly important. Um, in ensuring or helping people to navigate some of the social services such as Centrelink and other services that and, and charity funding that, that was available in different areas. Very quickly, the team had to learn how to become an expert and how to navigate those kinds of services. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, our GPH provides a number of services in the mental health field. So we were really looking at ways that we could facilitate new and innovative approaches to the delivery of mental health services. So for many in our Aboriginal communities, a face-to-face -face isn't really the most conducive way to provide um, mental health support. So we're really trying to help facilitate different community events, barbecues, those types of things to be able to, to facilitate those connections and, and providing that much needed support essentially. Um, and really looking at it, delivering them in a, in a very flexible way. Um, longer term, our priority has been to, again, it's all around very flexible service delivery. And this is where um, funding agencies like RDN and the Department of Health have been really valuable in, in, in really supportive we've found in, in being able to deliver um, services in, in quite a different way. And, and as I said, this was new territory for us to navigate for, for funders and for service providers. Um, and it, it, it was actually, I think, one of the strengths of the response was actually being able to utilise funding to bring new staff on who can provide that additional supporting community. Um, the longer term, we're, we're really looking at the longer term, obviously, with um, bushfires, there's the immediate impact, but the trauma and the, the impact of those fires occurs for, for a long time. 
Unfortunately, we live in a society that has a news cycle of a couple of weeks at best. And I think already many of, of kind of we've moved on to COVID and now we're talking about Black Lives Matter and all of the issues go through a, a in some ways a very short cycle. Um, the impact of the bushfires will be felt for a long time. Um, just the the places like Mogo where the big parts of the town were destroyed and Cabago as well was probably one of the more famous, um, I guess, um, areas when the, the visit of the Prime Minister there and the reception he got down in Cabago. These are communities who do feel very isolated and forgotten. And I know Eden is another community that feels that when even when the response was happening to the bushfires that they were left isolated because there was limited transport out of the community. And um, yeah, many in the community are, are still feel feel forgotten in many ways. So our longer term um, activities to really work with those communities is around, is around the social and emotional wellbeing and, and looking at those kinds of trauma management programs. So running things like the Red Dust Healing Program, um, one of our Aboriginal health workers, Joey Briley, has been working with communities and schools in the Mogo, Batemans Bay and Maria areas. And looking at applying that program, which really looks around and has been adapted to, to look at the influence of culture and, and the intergenerational trauma and essentially addressing that through cultural uh, engagement to try and address some of those things is really important. Um, we're also been looking at things like uh, cultural walks and integrating. Culture is a really important part for us. We recognise that to help people get over trauma, we need to help them to engage with culture and find opportunities to do that. So we're looking for opportunities to constantly do that through um, through recorded storytelling, particularly among some of the elders that we have in our communities so that we can capture their stories and experience to share with their future generation. Um, also looking at, um, uh, yeah, uh, different cooking and lifestyle programs as well. So um, we, we run um, some skills building workshops around um, learning how to, to shop and cook, um, physical activity type programs. Uh, we're actually just about to start a gardening program in the Maruya area as well, as well as an art program. So we've run these types of programs before where people, they facilitated programs usually with a mental health worker. So people can process some of their emotions in a cult culturally appropriate, uh, culturally appropriate way. Um, so yeah, th this is kind of the impact and, and there are a few key messages that I'd really um, like to share, I guess, with, with all of you uh, or some reflections, I, I guess. It, it, it's really hard essentially to, to um, you know, deliver, I guess the helicopter here is a really good um, analogy in some ways, just a helicopter in support at a time of crisis really needs to be a long-term sustained effort um, to address some of the trauma and grief that's happening in, in communities. Obviously at the moment, um, COVID-19, uh, the underlying community grief I touched on early on, are really compacting, uh, compounding the impact of the bushfires from earlier this year. Um, people, despite their resilience, and our communities are incredibly resilient, they're incredibly strong, they've come through so much, um, but it's just relentless, to, to be honest. And I think many, many people working in the field would just use that word relentless, that it's, it's one thing after another um, that, that is just compounding grief and trauma in community. Um, what was really important for us, this was an event that none of us could prepare for or, or despite our best efforts to plan for these types of activities, this we were charting un unchartable territory in many ways to know what sort of impacts would, would have. We were delivering generators and oxygen machines at one point to different community members. 
trying to get people to, to transport in, in, you know, um, places like Canberra and attending uh, emergency appointments. Um, so that really flexible and responsive approach was important. And I'd just like to acknowledge and again in a moment, but Rural Doctors Network and the Department of Health were really um the, the com- level of communication was fantastic. They were t- I know they were touching base with me, usually on a weekly or bi-weekly basis, just to get an update of what was happening. Um, meanwhile, they were trying to mobilise some of the resources they had to be able to, to do things in a different way, and, and that was really important. The other point I'd, I'd note, as I've noted before, recovery is a very slow process, and it, it will take us years. Um, if there's a way for us to be able to maintain the effort in these communities, I think I think the return on investment will be very good. Um, we, we've got a lot of potential additional benefits in terms of chronic disease management, um, but to really look at the long-term healing of these communities, particularly in an environment where many of our funding models are either year to year, um, a lot of core funding's disappeared. There's a lot of new service provision models like NDIS, My Age Care, which has really changed the ability of many service pro- providers to to pro- project long term to deliver long long term um, service delivery. The other, the other point that I'd make, and particularly around mental health services, is that in many of the communities where the fires were affected, there were limited resources anyway. So mental health workers were, were fairly rare. There's not a lot of people from those communities with, with the adequate level of training to provide those mental health supports. Um, and then even at times where where funding becomes available, and there was a lot of funding from Coordinator and public, uh, Primary Health Network around mental health services, it's not always uh, easy to find the clinician who can provide those services on the ground. Again, that underlines the importance of looking at different flexible ways to deliver programs. So we were looking at art programs and and particularly having those facilitated by uh, an uh, an Aboriginal mental health worker, somebody who can provide ongoing support and, and for people who maybe don't need intensive one-on-one sessions. Um, obviously for us, a big challenge about implementing those programs has been COVID, physical distancing, all of those types of things and put the kibosh on delivering a number of those programs. Fortunately, we're looking about getting some of those up and running again. Um, which will be um, particularly important um, for communities. The feedback that we've got, we've been doing our outreach at the moment, and the feedback we're getting from community is that they've felt so socially isolated because of the fires, but now particularly because of COVID, it's been really hard for them to be able to engage um with their family, with their friends, um, just to, to catch up with neighbours and all of those types of things. So it's been really important. You know, a visit that would normally take maybe 20 minutes is taking a couple of hours. So it's all done through the, the screen door and through, you know, the physical distancing. But that physical contact is really important to our communities. Um, and, and essentially it's it's the first time that people, some of our clients have been visited either since the fires or even before the fires. So having those resources, there are particular, especially community-based resources. So from our Aboriginal communities, there's so many great people there who are who are desperate to be able to work with their community. And some of the funding um, that was offered, we, we could really bring those people on board fairly quickly. So again, thank you. A big thank you to RDN and the Department of Health, Mel Gatt and the Aboriginal um, Indigenous Affairs Department there, as, and they really were some of the first responders in getting that funding onto the ground. Um, I, again, would like to acknowledge um, the people who I work with, the people in my teams, um, for continuing to serve their communities despite dealing with their own trauma and loss. Um, as, as many people tell me, it's a job that, that really is, it sounds very cliche, but it's a job that is seven days and 
um, for many people, pro- providing their own self care is hard enough. When you're dealing with issues around around trauma and loss in your own family, um, it's then hard to back up and be able to provide that high level of support to community. So full respect to, to my teams, um, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal have worked really hard together. And I think some of the good news stories I remember Joey saying to me is that as terrible as it is, these fires have brought all of our community together and have probably gone more towards reconciliation um, than the past 20 or 30 years of, of nice speeches and different activities. It's where community have really come together, supported each other, and, and um, that, that's made such a big difference. I'd like to thank our partners and service providers, so Katungal, um, AMS, Waminda, others who have all been working um, also equally as hard in this space and, um, you know, working in a spirit of openness and, and a, taking a real collegiate collaboration approach to, to delivering those services. Despite all the trauma over the past kind of six to, to eight months, we, we do see signs of regrowth. You know, our communities are incredibly resilient. Um, people have come through so much and I, I don't want to kind of portray this as, as a community who are, who are um, you know, not without any resilience or, or strength and constantly admire and blown away by by the the things that people have come through and and really you know continue to work towards some of those so it, it will take us some time but um i'm very much and i know our team is is looking forward to to continue to build those strong links with community and and to continue to deliver services on the ground so thank you very much again for the opportunity and um, yeah, I hope you found this presentation useful. Thank you. Mm-hmm.